Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. If you're anything like me, you probably spent a lot of your youth listening to music at inadvisable volumes. You went to shows and left with your ears ringing. You'd blow out the speakers in your car and then scream along with your friends. Or at least you would if you were a metalhead. Honestly, looking back, I'm amazed and grateful at how little permanent damage I actually did to my hearing, but if I had the chance to go back and do things differently to be more careful and protect these fragile little organs that make my job possible, I might start wearing earplugs to more shows, but I wouldn't turn my speakers down. I loved the music, I still do, and it just doesn't work quiet. But why? Why does metal have to be so loud? This question started for me as a simple late-night curiosity, and as with so many passing thoughts, I decided to tweet it and see if anyone could point me to a good explanation. The overwhelming response was that metal sounds better loud because all music sounds better loud. And that's true. Any audio engineer could tell you that. When you turn the music up, it becomes richer, fuller, and more vibrant. And that's not just an illusion, either. It has to do with the way your ears work, but in order to explain that, we have to be clear on what we mean when we say volume. When you turn up your speakers, you're increasing its absolute volume, or more technically, you're increasing the pressure of the sound waves it produces. We measure this in decibels, which correspond to the amplitude of the wave. The bigger the pressure difference, the higher the decibel level. That's it. But your ears are a little more complicated than that. A lot of the information of human speech takes place in the mid-frequencies on the order of a couple thousand hertz, so human ears have evolved to be particularly good at hearing that range, especially when it's quiet. Effectively, your body has a built-in mid-boost that it turns on at lower volumes to make sure you can understand what the people around you are saying. As the absolute volume goes up, this becomes less necessary, so the perceived volume flattens out, allowing for more low and high frequencies to be heard. This results in a well-known chart in audio circles called the Fletcher-Munson curve, which maps out the perceived volumes of different frequencies at different decibel levels. It's hard to draw, but the result is basically what you'd expect. We're best at hearing things in a range of 1,000 to 5,000 hertz, with our best hearing around 3 to 4,000. Below and above that, we need higher decibel levels in order to sound equally loud, but as the absolute volume increases, the difference becomes less drastic. As far as your ears are concerned, louder music generally has more frequencies in it across a broader range, which makes it fuller and more exciting to listen to. But while that may all be true, none of it answers my question. These effects show diminishing returns at high volumes. According to most of the mixing guides I've found, if you really need to hear all the frequencies in a nice, well-balanced spectrum, you probably want to be working at around 85 decibels. But Manowar, who bills themselves as the loudest band in the world, has a clause in their contract that requires any venue they play at to have a sound system capable of 126 decibels minimum. That may not seem like a huge difference, but the decibel is a logarithmic scale. Going up 6 decibels means doubling the pressure of the sound, which means Manowar is playing over 100 times louder than the Fletcher Munson curve says is ideal. For reference, depending on who you ask, the threshold where sound becomes physically painful is around 120 to 130 decibels, and you can suffer permanent hearing loss from prolonged exposure to volumes as low as 90 decibels. The sheer volume volume of a Man War show is literally dangerous, and they're not alone. Other rock and metal bands like Motorhead, ACDC, and The Who all regularly played shows in that same range. That's not a choice you make in order to properly balance the perceived distribution of the frequency spectrum. That's a choice you make in order to be loud at any cost. Metal culture celebrates loudness not for its acoustic properties, but for its own sake. But why? Why does metal have to be so loud? As with most styles of music that weren't popular in 19th century Germany, metal is pretty understudied, so there's not a lot of scholarship on this question. Fortunately though, a friend of mine pointed me to a paper by Dr. Michael Heller, and as a metalhead, a lot of what he said felt right to me. It resonated with my experience, so I'm just gonna roll with it. In the paper, Heller lays out three loudness effects, three things loudness in music does that might help explain the inherent aesthetic value placed on it by metalheads. The first of these is listener collapse which sounds brutal, and yeah, it kind of is, but not in the way you might expect. The thing is, listening is weird. If you take your hand and press it into a nearby surface, you're feeling, with a relatively high resolution, the texture of that surface. Your sense of touch is a physical impulse, created by an object pressing into your body. And sound is also created by an object pressing into your body, in this case the air around you, but it doesn't feel physical. There's too many layers of abstraction between the sound and your experience of it. This creates a boundary between you, the listener, 
listener and the thing you're listening to. Even though all your ears are actually doing is measuring the motion of a small column of air molecules within your ear canal, the phenomenon of sound feels external. It's not a part of your body, it's a thing that happens outside of your body. Sounds are heard from a distance, not felt from within. But anyone who's ever been to a truly loud show knows that's not true. At high enough volumes, this illusion of externality breaks down. Concert attendees often report a sense of oneness with the music, of being surrounded by it and existing within it, hearing the sounds not from afar, but as an intimate internal process. And that's partly physical. When the volume is high enough, sound waves can penetrate your body, triggering sensory organs not designed for hearing. This is especially true for lower frequencies. A loud bass can feel like an earthquake in your chest. These signals can't be processed by your brain as sound, and yet they're clearly associated with sonic events. The music becomes this all-encompassing, multi-sensory experience that takes place not around your body but through it, collapsing the imagined distance between the listener and the sound. But it's not just physical, there's a psychological aspect here too. Remember, the volumes that metal bands play at often sit near the threshold of physical pain, and experiences of extreme pain can break down your sense of self. Painful sensory inputs draw your attention to the sensory organs themselves, like the burning sensation of staring directly into the sun, which for liability reasons I need to clarify that I'm not recommending you do. Seriously. Please don't do that. For our purposes, painfully loud sounds force you to really experience your ears, and that overwhelming awareness of those suffering organs shatters the illusion of sound as an external phenomenon that is merely observed, never felt. In writing this, Heller cites research on torture, but he's quick to point out that experiences that are torturous when forced upon you may be euphoric when freely chosen. Metal culture in specific has many ways of ritualizing pain, most obviously the mosh pit. To an outside observer, a good pit may look like a sea of uncontrolled violence, but at most metal shows, behavior within the pit is governed by strict codes of conduct. If someone falls, you help them back up. If someone's trying to leave, you clear a path. The details may vary, but to metalheads, these pit codes are sacred and violations of them are harshly punished. These unspoken rules create a space where willing participants can safely engage with the liberatory nature of pain, surrendering to the pit by throwing their bodies into each other in a violent act of communal release. Of course, this is all somewhat romanticized. Accidents do happen, as does assault. A mosh pit is only as safe as the people in it, but most of them are much safer than you'd imagine. And for an audience that revels in rituals of pain and violence against other audience members, is it any surprise that the music that guides the action would be painfully loud as well? In that sense, the extreme volume is a way of bringing listeners together, of bonding through shared pain, collapsing the barriers not just between listener and sound, but between listener and surroundings, between listener and other listeners. The rest of the world melts away, along with each individual's sense of self, until all that's left is the shared experience of the music that surrounds and consumes us all. The second effect Heller mentions is imagined loudness. This is one that a couple folks hit on in my Twitter thread. Metal sounds better loud because metal just sounds loud. If I play this... It sounds kinda weird. Something about the audio clearly implies that it was recorded at a high volume, so it only feels natural to play it back the same way. Metal simply sounds loud, regardless of whether or not that's how we're actually hearing it, and that perceptual bias is extremely hard to escape. To quote Dr. Robert Valser, Even when it is heard from a distance, or even sung softly to oneself, metal is imagined as loud. But why? I think there are three main sounds that listeners associate with the genre, and all three of them contribute to this sense of imagined loudness. The first is, of course, the distorted electric guitar. These days, you can play any level of distortion at any volume with the help of effect pedals, but those only date back to the 60s. In the early days of the electric guitar, in order to achieve a distorted tone, you had to turn your volume up too high for your amp to handle. The speakers had a fairly limited range of motion, and if you tried to push past that, the sound would start to clip. This natural distortion, often called Overdrive was originally a design flaw, but it quickly became popular in certain styles like the electric blues that wanted to play loud anyway, and the electric blues went on to have a huge influence on metal. Because it originally only worked at high volumes, distortion has historically been associated with loud music, and even though we have the technology now to reproduce it quietly, that association endures. When you hear a quiet, distorted guitar, the most natural assumption is that it's being played loudly far away. The second sound is the distorted voice. Like with the distorted guitar, extreme vocal distortion can actually be 
done pretty quietly with proper technique. A lot of metal singers aren't singing any louder than normal speaking volumes. Instead, they rely on microphones, amplifiers, and a friendly sound engineer in order to be heard over the rest of the band. But that sort of quiet scream technique takes a lot of training and practice. The easier way to distort your voice, and the one most people assume they're hearing until they learn otherwise, is just screaming real loud. When you scream, air pressure and tension combine to warp the sound coming from your vocal cords. Some metal singers, especially the cleaner sounding ones, are doing a version of this, albeit still usually with a safer, more controlled technique, but much like with guitars, some sort of distorted vocal delivery is possible at basically any volume level. Across the board, though, these techniques evoke the paralinguistic sound of screaming, and since screaming is loud, we imagine these voices are too. And the third primary sound of metal is the drums. Metal drums tend to be extremely fast and deeply resonant. The former is achieved by moving your body very quickly, and the latter is achieved by hitting the drums very hard. I... uh... I don't think I need to explain this one. All three of these sounds contribute to metal's sense of imagined loudness, but there's one more factor we need to consider as well. Metal is loud. This gets a bit recursive, but hear me out. We know from cultural experience that metal is loud, so when we hear things that we recognize as metal, we assume them to be loud. This means we have once again experienced metal as loud, which reinforces our pre-existing assumption that metal is loud, so the next time we hear metal, we'll be even more inclined to assume that it is loud. It's a self-sustaining feedback loop of cultural context, and it allows us to perceive metal music at the volume it was meant to be heard, even in situations where actually turning it up to those levels would be impractical. The final loud the effect that Heller discusses is noise occupation, and for this I'd like to start with a story. For years, I lived a couple blocks away from the studio where they filmed Jimmy Kimmel live. Whenever they had a musical guest, they would always have them go outside and play an extended set for the studio audience, and these sets were loud enough that I could clearly hear them from my apartment. If I wanted to watch TV, or listen to my own music, or quietly read a book, I was out of luck. Whichever band Kimmel had that night was going to be all I heard until they stopped playing. Now, if I had been playing music that loudly, I would have got a noise complaint, but Kimmel had the appropriate permits, so there was nothing I or any of my neighbors could do about it. Because the show had money, influence, and power, they were allowed to dominate the shared acoustic landscape of the neighborhood whenever they wanted, and we just had to wait until they were done. Now, I'm not telling you this because I'm still annoyed about it. I mean, I am, but that's not my point. No, I'm telling you this to demonstrate that control of the soundscape isn't neutral. Sound is power, and people who are allowed to make sound are powerful. From store owners playing high-pitched tones to drive away teenagers just looking for a place to hang out, to LRAD devices devices used by police to weaponize sound at dangerous levels in an act of violence against protesters, the ability to control what is heard has long been a means of controlling what is done. But sound isn't just used by the powerful, it's also a tool of resistance. That's part of why protesters chant. It's a non-violent way to disrupt the soundscape of the oppressor and audibly assert their right to exist in that space. This can be for some specific cause, but loud noises can also be a form of personal declaration. Dr. Philip Tagg compares the volume of metal to the volume of motorcycles, and that makes sense. Biker culture has long been a part of metal music. In fact, one of the earliest uses of the term heavy metal in a musical context was in Steppenwolf's Born to be Wild. I like smoking lightning. Heavy metal thunder. And the rest of the lyrics make it pretty clear that the heavy metal thunder is the sound of a motorcycle engine. And for bikers, while removing the muffler or making other noise-increasing modifications may have some minor benefit in performance, a large part of the appeal is simply to make more noise, to make your presence known within the urban landscape you're forced to navigate. A motorcycle's relative mobility in heavy traffic makes it a symbol of freedom, and a roaring engine lets you rub that freedom in your fellow motorists' faces. And metal is the ultimate expression of that desire. Under the right conditions, a band like Manowar could be heard for miles, and by attending the show, you get to be a part of it. In this sense, while our other loudness effects were about the experience of the audience, noise occupation is about the experience of everyone else. We talked earlier about the profound difference between voluntary and involuntary suffering, and here we see the other side of that coin. Some of the appeal of a metal show is that you get to experience the volume, but another part is that everyone else has to as well. You're inflicting this disruptive noise on the world around you, not necessarily in a cruel or sadistic way, but as an act of rebellion. It's a way of saying we're here and we will be heard. Like the roar of a Harley Davidson cruising through rush hour traffic, it makes your presence impossible to ignore, and for a moment, 
that makes you powerful. In a world that keeps getting louder and more chaotic, it's easy to feel like you have no control over your surroundings. From massive shows with towers of amplifiers to just turning up the volume in your room to annoy your parents, metal offers a way to take that control back to be a master of your own soundscape. To me, this feels like the most important aspect of metal's love of volume. Metal is a genre about power fantasies, and there's nothing more powerful or more fantastic than noise. And hey, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to our featured patrons, Susan Jones, Jill Sundgaard, Duck, Howard Levine, Warren Hewitt, Kevin Wilamowski, and Grant Aldonis. If you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.